morning. Good morning. Chief, at least some of you pitched up this morning. I thought, yes, Lord, what's happening? December's here. Everybody's on holiday. Everybody decided, no, don't go to church this morning. Let's not uh, do that. Anyway, it is really good to see you. And uh, the Spooners are on leave already, so that's where they are. But uh, yeah, really amazing. We had a wonderful time this week with uh, the, the, uh, the, the, what's it, what I had, uh, the over 65s. I don't want to put it, the, the seniors. The seniors amongst us. Just now, I'm going to be a senior, then what am I going to say? It's like you, the seniors amongst us, it was absolutely wonderful. We had an amazing lunch with them. With uh, that, it was 70 odd people here and a phenomenal time. It was a time, it was a, we friends had their party, end of year party here, and a Timberland Letu had their end of year party here as well. So it was a week of end of year functions. So really amazing. Celebrating what God's done in the year, being very good to us in all departments. So just really thankful to God. Well, friends, we are nearing the end of our Irresistible Church series on the book of Thessalonians and part 25. And next week will be part 26 done. So we are, we're coming to the end of that. I'm really wanting to get through no more end times eschatology today. That's done. So some of you are like, thank God for that. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> Others of you are like, please Stan, we, this is important. We need to know more about this. And how can you say that Stan? We don't, I was, you know, everybody's got their thing. But just to let you know, we will be coming back to that next year, and we're going to be covering some of those things in depth, just so, we, just so we can get a handle of those things, and so we can be encouraged by those things, not, by, not so that we can win arguments, and so that we can have life, and life abundant, and know what we're doing, and know where we're going. Anyway, so we're back at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 12, verse, no, 5 verse 12, sorry, there's only five chapters in 1 Thessalonians. Not going to find chapter 12 there. Jeepers, there's like a million things open on my iPad here. Not good. My kids. 1, one Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 12. Until verse 22. This is probably one of the most inspiring parts of the series that I've done. It's been absolutely so challenging in one aspect, but so inspiring in another part. Um, so I trust that you are encouraged this morning. Now we ask you, brothers, remember he's been talking about times and dates and the second coming of Jesus, and he's been, he said to before that he's been speaking about living to please God around our, around our sexuality and our purity and working hard and not leeching off others and living a quiet life and working hard with our hands and learning to love each other and all these kind of, he's going through all these things. Now it gets to verse 12 and he says, now we ask you, some, some translations say beseech you. It's like a, it's, like a, 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 it's an urging, it's, it's a soft word. It's not, a, it's not an exhort you command word. It's like a, I'm really asking you now kind of word. Brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Yo. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. It's packed, like series upon series, just in those verses. Let me give you 
some background and then jump into these things. There's a problem in the church, and one of the problems that we know as we've been talking about, and we see this in 2 Thessalonians, actually, is what the problem is. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 to 12, particularly, we see that there are idle and disruptive people. People are, have given up their jobs and they're becoming busybodies. They're not doing anything. They're becoming burdensome to the community. And Paul says this to them in verse 11 in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. He says, we hear that some of you are idle and disruptive. Same words. They are not, they are not busy. They are busybodies. They've got nothing to do, so they're getting involved with stuff they shouldn't be. They should be running in their own lane and working hard and being a blessing to others, but they're not. Such people we command and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire in doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey your instruction, our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. You're not playing. Yet, yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. So what's happening? These guys are doing nothing. They're idle, they, they, they're coming busybodies, and they're not eating, and they're, they're not working, and so now they're, now they're what are we, when you're not working, what do you eat? And these are not people that can't work, these are not people that won't work. Different. They will not work, and so what's happening, they're becoming a burden to the community, and he's saying to them, listen here guys, and Paul late, earlier on has said, by the way, look at my life, I worked so that I wasn't a burden to you, that was my life with you. Actually, the, this is the problem, these guys are a problem. And the reason why they're a problem, which we see, the reason why they've done this, we see in, one, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, is because they've, be, they've got confused with the teaching of the second coming of Jesus. They thought Jesus had come already, or they thought that actually because he's coming immediately, that actually they can give up their work. There's no point in working anymore. This is why the understanding of the coming of Jesus is so important, because it has implications for the way you live. And so they've stopped working waiting for Jesus. That's the reason. And there was some prophetic word or some spiritual word that came through, a letter or a, some preaching that came through that, that kind of pulled them that way. And Paul in 2 Thessalonians corrects it and says that some, some word or some letter or some prophetic word has come and it's come as though it's coming from me just to let you know it didn't come from me. That's not the teaching of Jesus. And so what's happened is this has got involved in the church. And now Paul, and now what's happened is the leaders of the church, the elders of the church, have come in and corrected it. And it's caused a bit of friction in the church. Maybe they've been overly strong in their correction. Maybe they haven't been tactful in their correction. Maybe they haven't done it. Maybe they, what they said was right, but maybe how they said it was not right. I don't, we don't know, but there's been a bit of tension. And so he writes 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. And so because of this tension, there's been, a, there's been a disregard of people in the church for the leaders, for the elders in the church. And so Paul writes, verse 12. Let's go back and read what it says. He says, we ask you to acknowledge or recognize or appreciate the value of those who would work hard among you, who care for you, other translations, this is a newer NIV, the older versions, the more, um, and the more direct versions, the more literal versions say those of you that are over you in the Lord and who admonish you, who, who encourage you, who warn you, who speak to you, who speak straight to you. He says, I need you, I need you to, to correct something here. I need you to, to, to acknowledge and recognize and appreciate the value of these people that are your leaders that are speaking the truth to you. This is an incredible word to the church. It's instructive for us as the church, but it's also instructive to us as leaders because it's full of truth here. It says, for those who work hard among you. So elders in the life of the church are meant to work hard. Just because you work at the church, it's not a freeloading position. Meant to work hard, it's hard work. 
pastoral ministry and who care for you, who are over you in the Lord. You've got a job to do. Elders in the life of the church have got a job to do. And that job has got to do with overseeing. It's, it's, given, it's been given spiritual authority to oversee a congregation of people, to look after them, to care for them, and to exercise that spiritual authority with, with, together with effective leadership. So a shepherd's heart with skillful hands. And those who admonish you. So you see there, the elders are meant to work hard. They're meant to be over you and care for you. And they're also meant to admonish. They're meant to correct. They're meant to bring truth. They're meant to not only care and encourage, but also warn and rebuke and correct. That's part of it. And he says, I want you to acknowledge and recognize and appreciate some translations say respect the value of these people. He goes on to say, hold them in the highest regard in love. Esteem them in love. Hold these people in high regard because of their work. Not because you like their personality, not because you prefer that person to that person, but because of their work. This is what he says to the church. He says, those leaders over you, those elders over you, what I want you to do is I want you to esteem them highly. Those that are doing a job in God, that are looking after you in God, because of their work. And he goes on in the last little verse there, I realized it says, live at peace with each other. And he's basically saying the congregation needs to live at peace with its leaders and its leaders need to live at peace with its congregation. Because where there's no peace, there's no building. The prince of, when the prince of peace is in the house, there's peace. And we, we know in Hebrews chapter 13 when you've got discouraged leaders, it's not good for you, it says. It's no, it's no good to you to to, to kind of have leaders that are not full of courage and ready to, to, to go forward in God and are not full of faith. And so there's this constant urge in the scriptures to make sure that leaders are encouraged by the congregation, but also that leaders are doing the work that they're meant to do in the congregation. Now I love what it says there, those who work hard among you. You see, elders are meant to be among us, among us. We're meant to be among each other. You've got to be among each other before you over people. You don't just get to be over people, you get to be among people. You get to be rubbing shoulders with people, doing serving with people, and then exercising spiritual authority in that place, among people. Not above people, among people. And he, he, he kind of wants to correct that. I, I love what Daddy Daniel used to say, he said the job of leaders in the church is to love the sheep, to feed the sheep, and then to lead the sheep. In that order. You get to love people. When you get to love people, then you get to feed people. You get to preach and you get, begin to help. And when you get to love people and you get to feed, then you get the privilege of leading. You don't get to lead and expect, them, and expect love to follow. You love and then you feed and then you lead. That's the heart of a leader. That's the heart of what we're going for in the life of the church. And he says, hold them in the highest regard and love. Esteem them in love. Amazing thing that. Then he moves on. I'm not going to say much more about that, but just it is absolutely key in the life of any church that sheep and shepherds work together recognizing each other, understanding the different roles that we play. And uh, when that happens, the church goes well. That's when, that's when Jesus comes to rule and reign. And when the shepherds are doing their job, Christ is being formed in the people. And when the sheep are esteeming and loving and respecting and submitting and doing those things and following well, not blindly, in faith, the scriptures, all those things, character, all those things, actually it goes well with you. 
It, it, it builds you up. It builds your marriage up. It builds your family up. It creates an environment of love and kindness. It creates an environment of healthy living. It creates a greenhouse in which everybody flourishes. This is the church that Jesus is building. But what I want to get to is it goes on a little bit further on there, and it talks about, it says these, a whole bunch of things. It says this. It says, after it says... Um, Live at peace with each other in verse 14. It says this, and we urge you, kind of it says we urge you, we ask you brothers and sisters. Then he goes on, he says, we urge you brothers and sisters. Again, kind of goes on to like another paragraph. And there's a whole bunch of things that he asks us to do. To warn those that are idle, to encourage the disheartened, to help the weak, to be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong and always strive to do what is good for each other. And some, when you kind of read that, you think, is he talking to the leaders there that he's speaking to, that he's spoken to about before? Is that what the shepherds are meant to be doing? I think it is. But I think that's more than that. I think that's what the whole church is meant to be doing. That's the culture that the leaders are meant to be instilling in the life of the church. So what I want to talk about this morning are the, is the irresistible cultures that are to be formed in the life of a healthy church. From this passage and uh, I'm going to break it into three it's that that portion there which represents something of our love for each other how we walk with each other how we are priest each other how we look after each other how we treat each other is the first section the next section is an irresistible, maybe we can put those, um, put the first slide up, thanks, Megs. Irresistible church cultures that change the world. Irresistible love for each other is the first one, and then the second one is ir irresistible love for Jesus, and then the third one is irresistible life in the Holy Spirit. Those are three big ideas here that he gets into, and each of them are like weeks of preaching on their own. But I would love to just touch on a few of these things. The first thing he does, let's go for the irresistible, the first, the first slide, please. Irresistible love for each other. If we're to be an irresistible church where our faith rings out and impacts and changes, these are the things that count inside of us. The first one is this. It's an irresistible love for each other. And I've got a whole bunch of different kinds of love that get exercised in the life of a local church. The first one is this. He says, warn those that are idle and disruptive. And I've already read to you in 2 Thessalonians how strong he is about that. He says, like, don't associate with these people when they're not listening. And he says, See, what I want you to do is I want you to all warn those that are that are living in this world and in this kind of space of not working and of just being disruptive. It's, it's, a, it's a military term of this disruptive word. It means, it means not cooperating, kind of out of rank and all over the place. Won't listen. And he says to them, warn them. And then in 2 Thessalonians, he tells you what to warn them. He tells them what you say to them. So this kind of love is tough love. There's a thing called tough love in the... In the, in the middle of the local church for those that won't work that are lazy not those that can't work those that won't work not those that can't find a job but are looking for a job but those that won't find a job and those are disrupted tough love the second kind of love that exists in the irresistible love that in the church is this he says this you need to encourage the disheartened, or some translations say the faint-hearted. In the life of a church are always people, that word disheartened is the word, if you direct it directly translated from the Greek, is called small-souled. Small-souled. This is somebody that has not got much faith. This is somebody that's timid. This is somebody that lacks courage. This is somebody that constantly needs to be built up and comforted and reassured and needs assisting strength to build them up. 
It's what, what's amazing is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul talks about the body, he says the weaker parts are indispensable to the body. You see, what God does with small soul people, he puts them alongside bigger soul people so that they can speak life into them and speak strength into them and speak bigness into them and tell them how big God is and tell them how much God is for them and not against them. And you constantly have to do that. This is a tender love. This is not tough love. This is tender love. This is a love that picks up, that assists, that keeps talking, that keeps talking. And we don't get tired. And we don't get tired of doing this. We keep doing it. We keep doing it. We keep doing it. In your home group, that person that rocks up every Tuesday and they're constantly faint-hearted and constantly dishearted, keep speaking life, keep speaking bigness, keep speaking life, keep speaking Jesus, keep speaking the Father until they start to, the size of their soul begins bigger and bigger and bigger. Tender love. The third one is, it just says, help the weak. Help the weak. The weak, that, when that, that word weak means financially weak, intellectually weak, spiritually weak, somebody that's got a weak conscience maybe. Romans chapter 14, we can't eat this, we can't eat that. It says, don't let your faith destroy them. Anybody that's weak, we, we, we look after the weak. Physically weak, spiritually weak. Romans 15 verse 1 says this, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. We live for the benefit of the weak. Not always, all the time, but we've got to be, a, there's a part of the life of the church that we live for the benefit of the weak. This is what I call the labor of love. Because when you've got weak people, if you've got somebody that is intellectually weak, Unless God heals them, they're going to be intellectually weak in the life of the community and they're going to be like that until they die and we're going to have to look after them. You might have somebody that's disabled, physically weak. In the life of this church, they can find home because we come around them and look after them. Because in heaven, they're not going to have a disability. So we treat them as human beings And we encourage them and we put strength inside of them and we put courage in them and we, and we trust God for healing. But it's a labor of love. We keep doing it. It's not gonna go away. Then there's another kind of love. It says this. This is the most challenging thing in the whole world. Be patient with everyone. Because let me tell you right now, you cannot do any of that without this one. Be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. Love is patient. It starts with that. Love is patient. It literally means knows how to suffer long, long suffering. It has a long fuse, not a short fuse. Parenting needs a long fuse. Being married needs a long fuse for Heather. Helping the weak, patience. Helping the faint-hearted, do I have to say this again? Listen, you've been dealing with this thing for the last two years. I'm over it now. Patient. Patient. Challenge, 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 challenge. This is what makes us 
You see, it's impatient that makes us unkind in dealing with people. Because we get angry, we get frustrated, and then it boils over, and then we mess it up. See, the very f- basis of love is patience. How patient are you? You know the basis of patience? You know why we can be patient? Because we have the bigger picture of Jesus in our lives. Number one, we know this. If we're honest about ourselves and we have a, just a smidgen of self-awareness, We know Jesus has been patient with us. My God, has God Jesus been patient with me? Number two, we know this. That every obstacle in front of us, we can be patient. You see, whether it's with people, or whether it's with a circumstance, whether it's with a faith venture, or it doesn't matter what it is, we've got to be patient. We know this, that every obstacle is a stepping stone into greater things. Actually, what Jesus is wanting to put in us is formed patience, trusting in him. It's called love for people and trust in him for things to work out. That every detour is designed by God for our good, then we can be patient not rush and not need to rush it is unbelievably challenging friends what makes you lose patience why are you impatient why are we impatient i think it's because we don't trust god and we're unaware of how god has had to be patient with us I think if we could deal with the patience issue, we'd deal deal with 80% of all our issues. And can I just say this? I felt this in God. You've got to be patient with yourself. People are getting frustrated because they're failing and they're not measuring up and they know they should and they're trying to do better, and they know they can't, be patient, and allow the workings of God to take place in your life. Don't rush the goalie. Don't rush God. Let him do what he's going to do. Trust this. God is way bigger. God is way bigger than your issues. He is your father. He's looking after you, and he's dealing with you. Let him do it the way he wants to do it rather than the way you want it done. Be patient. Be patient with God's working in your life, as well as be patient with God's working in others. And then lastly, it says they make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Forgiving love. When we get wrong, friends, we don't punish other people. We don't take revenge. We don't punish. We don't withhold ourselves and we withhold our love and go and sulk. Sulking is paying back wrong for wrong, just in case you didn't know. He says, don't do that. Rather, he says, always strive to do what is good for each other. Oh, Jesus. Rather act in generous love. Powerful, eh? Number six, always strive for doing what is good. Rather than doing wrong for wrong, rather do good. Always do good for each other and everyone else. For those that have wronged you, for those that are around you, but everyone else, just generally do good. Be generous. This is the irresistible church of Jesus Christ. Man, 
do you not? You know, again, it comes down to a revelation of God. How do I not get revenge when I know I've been wronged? Or I feel I've been wronged because maybe you haven't been wronged. Maybe you just feel you've been wronged. You have to be satisfied in God. The Bible says this, when you are persecuted and when people come against you and you, you've got to know who you are in God. This is this irresistible church. Marks of a cultures in an irresistible church. Nobody paying back wrong for wrong. But bigger than not just nobody paying back wrong for wrong, but everybody doing good in place of. The second part of these texts is this. It's an irresistible love of Jesus. Or the always people. Why do I call it the always people? Because when you read the text... It says these short verses, it says this, rejoice always. In fact, in verse 15, it says, always strive to do what's good. So it starts there, always. Listen to the always. Rejoice always, pray continually, or you could say always. Give thanks in all circumstances, or you could say always. So what he's saying is he's saying, actually, this church culture that we're trying to have, this irresistible, this faith community that we have, lives in a space where we rejoice always, we pray always, and we give thanks always. Okay, Stan, fantastic. What world are you living in? You see, friends, this kind of a text shouldn't be thought of as this is God's will so I need to do it. Rather it should be thought of this is God's will so I can do it. Because it, it says there, look at what it says. It says there, don't uh, uh, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So when he says that, he kind of straight away alludes to the fact that this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And that's why I've said it's an irresistible love for Jesus. Because you can't do this without Christ. That is an impossible world to live in. Rejoice always. What do you mean, Stan? What happens when somebody dies in my family? Am I to rejoice? No. No. There's a time for mourning and there's a time for rejoicing. But somehow, they're like parallel lines on a railway track. You never lose one without the other. You're always rejoicing because you always know God is with you. You never lose the rejoicing. You never lose your joy when you're sad. It's not either or, it's both and. You, you have moments where you're leaning into sadness because of loss, but you quickly recover and you move and you change and you allow God to work in you, but you never lose your joy. Continually, there's always something to be joyful for. Somehow, there's the space in God where we are able to rejoice always, ever seeing the goodness of God. Ever seeing the goodness of God. A joy in all circumstances. Not joy because of circumstances, but in all circumstances. Pray continually, pray always. This is this idea of a moment by moment walk with Jesus. Constantly aware of Him, a non stop communion with God. It breaks every mindset of the church today that when you, you meet with God in a church building, in a worship service. No, you meet with God when you're with Him because He's in you. You are the building. You're the temple. You are the meeting place of God. You are the place where heaven and earth meet. You are. And so pray always, continually, aware of God, aware of being aware with God. Just pray continually, aware, aware of the presence of God, practicing the presence of God. It's like a Brother Lawrence kind of thing. 
this monk that used to practice the presence of God all over all his life while he was washing the dishes and serving and just learned this, this discipline of practicing the presence of God. And then giving thanks always in all circumstances. Where we understand circumstances don't dictate my joy. Again, friends, only in Jesus. Only in Jesus. Isn't it amazing? Those are all things in God's will. So God is a God of joy. Like his very nature is joy. He wants to give us joy. God is a God of relationship and intimacy. That's why we can pray continuously. See, God himself is somebody where he says, you can rely on my love. So it means you can live in an attitude of gratitude. You see, it, 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 these things, I think part of the reason why we can be the always people, always rejoicing and always praying and always giving thanks is we understand God is this very himself in nature. And so when we in Christ, we carry this. And so what, when I read this and I think, God, how do I do this? I don't get discouraged. I say, God, please teach me to do this. This is, this is your will. This can be lived out. Lord, please help us as a community to do this. You see, only in Christ are you free enough to be the always people. Only in Christ are you free, is freedom yours. Only in Christ have you got access to the Father. Only in Christ have you got confidence to be with Him and in the throne of grace. Only in Christ have you got all the, what you need to live this kind of life. And He's saying here, I want the church to be this kind of church. And lastly, isn't it amazing how gratitude and joy are inextricably linked? When we start to be thankful, joy fills our hearts. One of the ways that we can unlock joy is to be grateful, to be thankful. And then lastly, just to finish off with, he says these last few words in that verse, 60, uh, verse 19, the third set of irresistible life in the Holy Spirit. He says, don't quench the Spirit. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. In your life, in your walk with God, don't put out the fire of God. Don't put out what God is doing. When God is working, don't put it out. Don't touch it. Don't extinguish it, other translations say. Whether you're in a meeting, public life of worship, or whether it's in your own life. You see, we can, ex we can extinguish the, the work of the Spirit in our own life by, 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 by ignoring all that's gone before. Goes and he says, don't treat prophecies with contempt. And the reason why I think they were treating prophecies with contempt is that in 2 Thessalonians it says this prophetic word came and the guys were scheming, hey, listen, if that's the prophetic word, I'm not, I don't want anything to do with the prophetic. He says, don't treat the prophecy with contempt. Don't be cynical about the gifts of God. Don't be cynical about the prophetic word. When the, when the Spirit starts moving and the prophetic starts flowing, don't be cynical about, don't treat, don't look down on it. Don't, be, don't, don't despise it. He says, but rather what you must do is test it. You must test the word. You must test the word when it comes. You see, the solution to bad use is not, is, is not non-use. It's just right use. Or the solution to abuse or non-bad use is not, you've got to just do it Right. So what happens is you see it being done wrong. I know, I don't want that. I've seen that gone wrong before. We're not going to do that anymore. No, no, no. It's in the scriptures. God commands us to do it. So we do it. But we just do it as best as we know. Administrate it well. And we test it. How 
How do you test prophetic words? Should have actually done a slide for this. Just very quickly. Does it line up with the scriptures? If the word violates scripture, it's not from God. Number two, is in line with the character of God. Does it line up with the character of God and Jesus? Does it glorify Jesus? Is, there, is this something that kind of when, you, uh, uh, when Jesus is the exact representation of God, does this, does this word badly represent the Father? If it does, probably not from God. Number three, do you have a witness of the Spirit of God? Because you have the Spirit of God. Do you witness with it? If you don't witness with it, then don't receive it. But don't kick the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, I don't do prophecy anymore. Number four, and this is something of a discernment, I think you've got to discern something of the motivation and the spirit of the person that's bringing it. If they're angry and unloving and not willing for the word to be tested, probably not from God. Number five, is the word encouraging? Does it bring freedom and does it bring life? Even if it's a corrective word. You see that in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. And lastly, does it at some level confirm what God is already saying to you? Because God's speaking to us, friends. You don't need prophetic words to hear God. You have the Holy Spirit to hear God. What the prophetic does is it awakens us to what God is saying to us. And it witnesses with us. The reason why we have a witness is because that word witnesses what, what God's speaking to us. And so it brings life to us. I think those are just some ideas. There's probably more than that. It says, hold, don't, don't, don't um, treat prophecies with contempt. Rather test them. Then he goes and he says, hold on to what is good and get rid of what is evil. Even some of those prophetic words, if that, if that word is connected to the prophetic words, not, maybe not everything that is said to you will be good, but there are some things that will be good. Hold on to that. But just generally, hold on to good things and get rid of evil. That, that's how we kind of live life. And I think these are some of the cultures where we, we're part of a kind of a church that holds on to what is good things and we reject the evil of the world that confronts us. These are the things that I believe are cultures that God wants to put in the life of the church, in the life of his believers, in the life of his followers. An irresistible love for each other. An irresistible always people and an irresistible life in the spirit that flows and encourages and moves because you need the life in the spirit to live the life that he's spoken about before. Powerful, eh? A few 12 to 22, 10 verses, packed. Take three months just to unpack that, line by line, verse by word by word. Full of love. I'd love to pray this for you. If you wouldn't mind just standing, just as we end, come to an end. And I'll hand over to Nick. I love the prayer in, one, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 part of the prayer that Paul prays. And this is the prayer I pray for you. I'm going to read it twice. I pray that you, just, just go into like receive mode, whatever that looks like for you. I pray that you, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, 
so that you may have great endurance and patience. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. I pray that you'd be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I pray that we would be strengthened in accordance with the power of his glorious might so that we would have great endurance and great patience to love God's people. Joyfully giving thanks to the Father, continually and in all circumstances, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. I thank you, Lord. This is an impossible life without you. Those few verses, Lord, are, they're impossible to live without being in Christ. And I ask you, Lord, pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Give us a revelation of your Father's heart. Help us to be patient with ourselves as you deal with us. You are always for us and never against us in Christ. Always. I just feel I need to say this. If you are in Christ... and you have any smidgen of reality that God is against you because of your sin, if you're in Christ, and you have faith in Christ, even though you're messing it up, listen to me now. And you think God is against you. What you're saying is, the Father is against his Son. And he's not. The father gave life to his son. And the son lives to give glory to the father. We are in the son. You have freedom in the son. You have peace in the son. that in our hearts, Lord. If that's not in our hearts, Lord, we can't live this life. We can't rejoice always. We can't pray always. We can't give thanks always. We can't be patient with everyone. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we be strengthened with all power according to your glorious, glorious might. That we would have great endurance and patience and be able to give joyful thanks to our Father who has qualified us. Help us to live this life, Lord. Help us to live this life, Lord. I pray, I pray these verses would, the wrong word is haunt us, but be over us. I pray these, these, these verses, these 12 to 22, would so be on our walls in this house we love people and you know those things we put on our walls this would be our thing Lord rejoice always I want to be our always person Lord 
I know I'm not an always person. Especially when it comes to the people I love. Come, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, meet with your sons and daughters, Lord.